Hello and welcome back, royal family. Hello, hello. Today's date is the second. No April Fools today. <laughs> 4 2 24. We have enough foolishness in our leaders. I guess the uh, administration in Washington, D.C. made a decision to celebrate Ishtar, goddess of sexual fertility, with uh, Transgender Day. I don't know if you've heard that, but uh, they might have snuck that one under the radar, but everybody's talking about it. Transgender Visibility Day. So I guess that was changed, the normal day that we would have Ishtar. And many of you know, the true Passover and resurrection date-wise, because our calendars are different than they were 2,000 years ago, we have to look at what the Romans and the, and the Israelites used for calendars and dates and times, much different we would be going into the week probably of Passover and then resurrection after that. So, uh, but we did celebrate it last weekend and I hope you all uh, had time with your family and friends. You were able to uh, look at the message and go forward and do the Lord's Supper because it's very important we bring him into remembrance, obviously. It's very important that we celebrate the resurrection, not Ishtar, or well, the new transgender day that they've added onto the calendar. Folks, if you don't think we live in exciting times and there's a lot going on, I don't know what to tell you. Um, in fact, today's message is going to have a lot to do with being very careful, being very careful about what we believe. We're going to have to look at some hard truths today into Thursday's class um, concerning certain prophecies that people have pinned their hopes on and I'm going to tell you, it's not exactly what you think it is, so we need to open up to that today. And today's title, Human Predictions, Human Conclusions, Lead to Human Confusion. That's where the Spirit led me. Human Predictions and Human Conclusions Lead to Human Confusion. That's our title for today. You are in 2 Thessalonians, lesson or message number 66. You guys can open up in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 once again today, Royal Family, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Today's date, 4 2 24, number 66 is your message number. 2 Thessalonians, lesson 66, human predictions and human conclusions lead to human confusion is our title. Now, our brother in Christ, Rob, many of you met him at the conference, you're starting to know who he is, Robin Marler in Texas. I have about five Roberts or Robs or Bobs that follow the ministry. Don't want to get them all confused. But Rob came up and spent the weekend with me recently. Um, that's the Rob I'm talking about. He's been working behind the scenes. And, I, you know, I'm just blown away because, you know, even the uh, ministry I came from up in New England as an associate pastor and an assistant to my pastor at Grace Bible Church, shout out to the royal family up there. A lot of people will say they're going to do something or they make suggestions or let's do this or why don't we do that but they really don't get involved and put their hands on the ministry. They just throw it at the pastor or deacons and walk away. Here's a great suggestion, do this. Rob is putting his hands on this, and I give him credit. So Rob's been working behind the scenes to update prbministry.org, bottom of the slide. I suggest everybody go there. He's adding a third page to that website. I knew that website could do a lot more. I didn't have the time to do it. My job is to study and teach. That's it. Put together messages, put together books, do Bible conferences. I have a wedding coming up this summer I have to do. So, folks, my job is to study and teach as a pastor teacher. This is wonderful that Rob took this. He's been working behind the scenes. I want to keep him in prayer, him and his wife, Marla, because he's also working on a book. And he's been working behind the scenes to update prbministry.org with a third page on the website. That page will hold all kinds of links for your personal studies, so please go check it out when you have time. Please go check it out. I believe he updated it recently. So he has the key to my back door office there on prbministry.org. I gave him the passwords and all that stuff. So we share that uh, website, and he's going to be doing work on there. And right now, he started linking, I believe, almost all the Matthew series and now it's just links to YouTube messages, but he's organizing them with the titles. All the Matthew series, you'll be able to go on that third page, prbministry.org, get familiar with it. And he's linking everything on there for your personal studies. 
I'm sending him my notes. He wants to try to do something with the notes. Like I send them to Facebook as well. So let's keep Rob in prayer because I'm telling you what, he uh, not only said something, he stepped up and did it. He didn't throw it back on me to deal with it. So um, I'm impressed and I, I appreciate it. Rob, I love you. Thank you so much. So let's keep Rob and Marl in prayer. Let's keep the Bible conference in prayer. I'm about ready to contact after today. I think uh, Tristan and I are going to exchange some uh, messages back and forth. And we'll see about getting all the information, the flyer out. I have the new evangelist booklets. They're going to be coming out in your mailbox with the flyer for the Bible conference. All exciting things, all coming your way. Give me another couple of days. So I appreciate that. Let us get ready to jump into it. That's all the announcements I have. Let us get ready to do the most important thing we do. Two power options, first and foremost, which is what? We get filled with the Spirit and we get into the Word, focus on the mind of Christ. No other way to grow up. No other way to get close to God. No other way to have divine insight and discernment that God called you to have without the two power options. Because in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. In order to grow up, we have to take in the word of God and be filled with the spirit. Have our fellowship in order, new nature, Christ-like nature given to you at salvation. How do you do that, Pastor Rick? Quite simply, you wash your feet like the Lord did at the Last Supper from all the sins we may have had in the world in our old sin nature. First John 1, 8, 9, and 10, to believers... If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9, very simply, name and sight. If we confess our sins, believers, 1 John 1, 9, he is faithful and righteous to, to forgive us our sins, excuse me, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm excited about rebound. <laughs> you better be. 1 John 1, 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. Take a moment of silent prayer. All kidding aside, get serious, get focused on the word. Name and sight, any known sins, get your fellowship in order, your vertical relationship in order. Get ready to take in the word of God, the mind of Christ, Bible doctrine. And in doing so, get rid of your distractions also. And in doing so, we'll keep this lost and dying world in prayer. And I'm going to throw an extra prayer out there for Rob and Marla today. This is um, takes a load off me not to have to worry about that website. Because oftentimes months went by and I wouldn't even go on and do anything to it. Many of you know that. Now it's going to have some activity on it. Now the, the payments coming from the ministry to keep the website open are going to be used in the right fashion. So I'm excited. We have a Bible conference coming. We have an eclipse coming. We have a lot of things happening on the scenes. So let's keep this lost and dying world in prayer and each other in prayer. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And Father, we're going to lift up Rob and Marlon in prayer today. And I know they have some personal issues going on within their family. There's some medical issues going on there. And there's been a death in the family recently as well and different things going on with them. And Rob is still pressing forward. Father, give him the strength to keep going forward no matter what the attacks or distractions come. And Father, I'm praying for this whole little ministry that they can go forward and become involved in your word, involved in Bible conferences, involved in preaching and teaching the word to their circle of family and friends, and be the leaders you call them to be, Father. We're praying for one another, lifting each other up to give each other the strength. During these very volatile times, we realize there is a beast system being built around us, Father. And before we go up in a rapture, we want to be able to be responsible and strong believers at a level of maturity that we become soldiers and visible heroes in this spiritual warfare. Father, we're praying for one another. We're praying for this lost and dying world. And Father, I'm just praying that our leaders in Washington, D.C., and certainly the seat of president, would recognize the evil they've opened up and the evil they have been involved with, Father. And they would turn from their wicked ways 
and turn towards your truth. Father, we're praying for all these things. For your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's jump into it. We're going to be looking at a set of prophetic scriptures that cause great debate and have done so for hundreds of years. So, be open-minded, be critical thinkers. This will take at least two lessons and some historical groundwork we're going to have to fully digest. So we're going to have to go into some bits and pieces of history, probably more so next lesson. But now, in this section of 2 Thessalonians, we know the Apostle Paul is clarifying the events leading up to the second advent. That's what they were confused about, believers at Thessalonica. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, that's why he writes, No one is to deceive you, believers, in any way, for it will not come. What will not come? The end of the tribulation, the second advent of Christ, will not come unless the apostasy comes first. The man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of perdition or destruction. 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, who does what? He will oppose and exalt himself above every so-called God or object of worship, and he will do that certainly at the midway point. It will become very obvious. So that he takes the seat, there it is, in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. This royal family highlights the abomination of desolation at the midway point. I've showed you that in recent months. 2 Thessalonians 2.5 do you not remember, the Apostle Paul says, that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things. I taught these things repetitively. 2 Thessalonians 2.6 And you know, royal family, what restrains him now, the Antichrist, from coming to power, so that he will be revealed in his time. God has approved a certain time for this. God the Holy Spirit, folks, is the restraining ministry right now in the church age dispensation, and we are allowed to partake as positive believers as part of that restraining ministry. 2 Thessalonians 2.7 For the mystery of lawlessness, folks, I spent a lot of time on this, pointing to mystery Babylon, going backward into history, where this came from and what the Apostle Paul was pointing. 2 Thessalonians 2.7 For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Keep that in mind. It's been at work and it's being built. Only he who now restrains it, God, the Holy Spirit, will do so until he is removed, rapture of the church. Pretty simple, folks. People make it complicated. The mystery of lawlessness speaks to a system of deception, manipulation, lies, and counterfeits that began in the original garden. Again, if you've been with me, for the past two or three months, many of this will make sense. It increased over time, and it has, when it was halted or hindered, and it was, different points, by God's divine intervention at different historical points, Satan and his minions simply regrouped for a new angle of assault. They didn't catch God off guard. <laughs> God isn't shocked. He realized they were going to regroup and circle back around. He just was saying, you're not going to go this far. You went way out of bounds. See, Satan, what you're not witnessing and not realizing is the boundaries and the rules set up for this warfare, this spiritual warfare, Satan keeps bouncing in and out of them, but God stays within them. Because in the end, everybody's going to be able to look back and say, wow, isn't God fair and just that he allowed all this to play out, and yet Satan was twisting and cheating and lying the whole time. It's like discovering you went through a presidential race and you found out that all the votes were fraudulent. Or you watched the Super Bowl and found out it was all set up prior to. God's divine intervention at different historical points stopped Satan. Satan and his minions still regrouped for a new angle, a new assault. God allows this until the final time divine restraint is removed at the end of the church age dispensation, rapture of the church. I don't think it can be any clearer than that. Let me say this again. The mystery of lawlessness been around since the garden. It's only increased. The mystery of lawlessness and the mystery Babylon, big part of that, speaks to a system of deception, manipulation, lies, and counterfeits that began in the original garden. It increased over time and it keeps increasing when it was halted or hindered 
by God's divine intervention, different points of divine intervention, at different historic points, Satan and his minions simply regroup for a new angle or a new assault. God allows this until the final time divine restraint is removed at the end of the church age dispensation we know as the rapture of the church. And you looked at it just in 2 Thessalonians, the last couple of scriptures. This will be the completion of a beast system and Mystery Babylon will resurface from its dark corners of hiding within plain sight around the world. In other words, when it's all revealed, you're going to say, wow, that Mystery Babylon, that religious system that's going to be connected to the government and the ideology and all the things that go behind it, it's always been in front of us. It's been built all around us. We've been watching it. We've been allowing it and accepting it. This will be the completion of a beast system, and Mystery Babylon will resurface from its dark corners of hiding within plain sight around this world. Mystery Babylon is not only a religious system, it is a satanic ideology. Look what just happened with this Ishtar at the White House. They made a new holiday. It's a satanic ideology, a set of rituals designed to maximize sources of evil for not only the fallen angels to be dominant upon the earth, but for the human agents and seeds of Satan to step into the realm of demonic power or authority for a period of time. This is all laid out, folks. This is all laid out. This will be the completion of the beast system, and Mystery Babylon will resurface for, from its dark corners. It's always been there. It will resurface very plainly from its dark corners of hiding within plain sight around the world. Mystery Babylon is not only a religious system, it is a satanic ideology and a set of rituals designed to maximize sources of evil power for not only the fallen angels to be dominant upon this earth once again, but for human agents and seeds of Satan to step into realms of demonic power or authority for a period of time. In fact, many of them are like chess pieces already being moved around. It's been going on for a long time. This is why the buildup into the tribulation period has so much wickedness unfolding in the arenas of sexual perversion, corruption, criminality, broken systems of justice, and callousness of heart appearing across the landscape more and more as the years go by. That's why it's around us, folks. This is why the buildup into the tribulation, what you're witnessing and what you're feeling, the pinches and confusion you're feeling is a buildup into the tribulation. It had, that period has so much wickedness that even building up to it, the wickedness unfolding in the arenas of sexual perversion, corruption, criminality, broken systems of justice and callousness, appearing across the landscape more and more as the years roll by. No big shock if you're well-schooled Christians. The anti-establishment and anti-God sentiment increases in this type of environment. Again, no shock there. 2 Thessalonians 2.8 Then the lawless one will be revealed, the Antichrist. He cannot be fully revealed until you are into the tribulation. And at first, the first couple of years, it's going to be pseudo-peace. and everything. Everybody's going to think everything's great. And the Antichrist is going to be like a hero that many like and want to side with. 2 Thessalonians 2.8, Then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lamb, well, excuse me, the Lamb, oh yeah, amen, the Lamb of God, whom the Lord will eliminate with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his Second coming, second advent. The thing Paul is clarifying to the believers at Thessalonica that are confused, the second advent. In verse 7, the Apostle Paul clearly states the mystery of lawlessness has already been at work, and I explained it. Now in verse 8, it becomes revealed for those who have blinders on, because Satan blinds the world, but certainly... Believers that are uneducated and unbelievers are blinded. The reign of the Antichrist will become a time that everyone will have to wake up to the evil that the world is embracing. It's going to be a lot of shock and awe at the three and a half year mark. 
And as those things unfold and the, and the bowl and the trumpet judgments open all these things up in the tribulation period, there's going to be people that are going to be just running for the hills, and they should be. The sad part is, the sad part is, Satan will have a lot of fans in the human realm. I know, sad but true. Some people are so callous toward the truth of Jesus Christ, they will never come to believe. Very sad statement of affairs is going to happen in the tribulation. But I would say a lot of them are going to be shocked into believing. The second advent of Christ is when the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ returns as the warrior king and lays waste to all the demonic armies gathered in the valley of Megiddo, Battle of Armageddon. 2 Thessalonians 2.9, that is, the one who is coming, the Apostle Paul writes, is in accord with the activity of Satan. He's a pawn or a puppet of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders. 2 Thessalonians 2.10, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not accept the love, impersonal, unconditional, agape love of the truth, so as to be saved. Now, you guys can turn backward into the Old Testament. The prophet Isaiah, chapter 66. Go to the prophet Isaiah's writing, chapter 66. Old Testament, prophet Isaiah, 66. The truth, in verse 10, one of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only avenue into true, impersonal, unconditional virtue love. That's what's being stated there by the Apostle Paul in verse 10. The truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only avenue into true, impersonal, unconditional, virtue, godly love. Faith alone in Christ alone is the only source of salvation, and that is the pathway to what we would call godly love. That's why he states it like that. You cannot have it. You cannot have true, virtue, godly, impersonal, unconditional love, the kind that's taught, certainly in the New Testament. You cannot have it without a relationship with Christ and applying that relationship, living in it. God's perfect timing, something one have to look at. I've looked at it before. Many of you understand this. But God's perfect timing, which is all, everything, calculated into the divine decree, singular. I know we want to say divine decrees, plural, because so many things are covered. But with God, it's one and done. God's perfect timing, which is all calculated into the divine decree from eternity past, has allowances and periods of time that the wickedness of Satan and his army have victories or even seasons of extreme authority on the earth. You've witnessed it if you've been with me studying certain things about the fallen angels in Genesis 6, certain things about Nimrod, the bloodline of Cain, Canaanite, Cush, all these different things we've studied would show you God has certain allowances and periods of time all figured out in the divine decree from billions of years ago that the wickedness of Satan and his army have victories or even seasons of extreme authority on the earth. Ultimately, God is the final authority. Amen? We all understand that. Ultimately, God is the final authority, yet, during the angelic conflict, there is a specific freedom, best way I can describe it. During the angelic conflict, there is a specific freedom given to Satan and his army that we do not fully register right now in time. And I know that causes people some grief, and they want to say, why would God allow this? Why would God allow that? I can explain it to the best of my ability and show you as a pastor teacher and lead you and guide you and I'm hoping all of this opens up to you. But if you really don't understand the angelic conflict, why we were created, dispensations, mystery doctrine, the different things that you've learned, hopefully in this ministry or another qualified ministry, then you're going to be confused. God's always going to seem like he's angry at you or something's going on that you can't figure out. When it, you can learn, you can have discernment, you can learn the accuracy of the word and what's going on. But ultimately, God, yes, is the final authority, yet... Whether you like it or not, during the, the angelic conflict, what you're living in, why you were created, the angelic conflict is a specific freedom given to Satan and his army that we do not fully register right now in time. 
What I can tell you, and what the Apostle Paul is saying in 2 Thessalonians is, it could be a lot worse, and it will be once the restraining ministry rapture of the church and God the Holy Spirit steps back in a different role at the end of the church age dispensation. It'll be much worse. But they are allowed a certain amount of freedom. Satan does have certain victories. Not in the end. I've read the book. Guess what? The whole war is won by God. Amen? Jesus Christ upon the cross secured the victory of the war. There are little battles along the way. There are periods of freedom that Satan and his army seem to have. Yes, I'd be a liar to tell you different. Now, as you guys go into Isaiah chapter 66, keep in mind this is during a time when Israel was coming under attack against the Assyrian Empire long before the Babylonian captivity. That's the time period. Would have been around 740 B.C. In that neighborhood, Isaiah began his ministry around 740 B.C. So the Assyrians were marching in. The nation of Israel had already gone astray for a period of time, and I've showed you this many times. They see, and you can see it right in the Exodus generation. You can see it before that. You can see it in what I, the study I showed you about the, uh, the, the sons of Noah coming off the ark. Isaiah's ministry begins 740 B.C., but the nation of Israel had already gone astray for a period of time, on and off, on and off. Now, as we look at this today, it's important to have an open mind about future prophecy because I know this is going to upset some people but it shouldn't because it's going to take me two hours to go over it when I'm done with it I think you're going to sit back and say oh I get it but as we look at this today it's important to have an open mind about future prophecy because many Christians and teachers believe that they have been able to time the rapture and the seven years of tribulation with a handful of Old Testament scriptures and in Isaiah, there's a very popular one that people hang their hat on. So they say, we might not be able to know the exact time or date, but we can figure out which year it's going to be, how many years have gone by through a handful of Old Testament prophetic scriptures. I would warn you, just be careful and make sure you understand what those scriptures are. We can't take them out of context. And listen, I'm not saying... It is not important and that it doesn't have greater layers to it. All of these different types of things. I'm telling you, not every theologian and biblical scholar holds to the same beliefs of what you're going to see. So, we have to take a breath, take a step back. And many of you know, if you know Isaiah 66, there's, a, there's a probably two scriptures in there that go together that speak about something being born overnight. And I would say, be very careful. Let's really take a look at it. I myself have researched and dug deeper into this the past five years or longer. And I found that certain scriptures pointing out a possible definitive timeline to end time events may not be what I thought it was 10 or 15 years ago. That's all I'm telling you. And I would say, be careful. And if you're willing to stick with me today into Thursday's message... I think things will become clear. Obviously, for several reasons. One is the time and the geopolitical leaders came and went with no rapture or tribulation to be seen. I've mentioned this many times before. Second is that deeper studies over the years helps to open up greater insight into these scriptures and events. So if you want to go into exact times and exact peoples and all that stuff, I can tell you there's been a lot of exact times and exact people that were believed to be the time of the Antichrist or the time of the rapture or the time of this, and the time came and went. So either God got it wrong or mankind got it wrong. You choose. What you hear today may throw some cold water... <laughs> on your heated belief of certain times and events. Remain open-minded. Even if I throw some cold water on what you believe, remain open-minded and really look at these scriptures today. That's all I'm asking you. And I'll challenge you to go back and read some of these things and tell, and then you can send me an email. Isaiah prophesied a great deal about future events, obviously, of not only a Syrian occupation of the land, but looking ahead to Babylonian 
occupation and deeper into the second advent of Christ as well. Do not lose sight of that. So we know there's layers here, but these are the things that it covers. In fact, most scholars believe, starting in chapter 61 of Isaiah, right into chapter 66, is all a strong indication of the second advent and millennial reign of Christ on earth. In fact, I would tell you the men in my lineage have taught that. So, you can choose to digest what you want, but in fact, most scholars believe, starting in chapter 61 of Isaiah, right into 66, is all a strong indication of the second advent and millennial reign of Christ on earth. Now, are there a handful of scriptures in there that might show us certain things? Possibly, but be careful about pinning all your hopes putting all your eggs in one basket, I guess we would say. So, <clears throat> excuse me, these four or five chapters, verse 61 into 66, these four or five chapters actually flow right into the next one very smoothly. So in other words, if you're reading these chapters in Isaiah, you can't just take a hard stop at the end of verse six, uh, chapter 63 into chapter 64. Much of it is what we call a large discourse. Just some food for thought. So, within Isaiah chapter 62, there's a highlight of the regathering of the nation of Israel in the future that's pretty apparent. In chapter 62, I'm going to put something on the board. Isaiah proclaims a marriage or a covenant fulfilled and Israel is reestablished under God. So he says that in, in, in chapter 62. Isaiah 62, 11, Behold, the Lord is proclaimed to the end of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation is coming. Behold, his reward is with him, his compensation before him, verse 12, and they will call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you will be called a sought out, a city not abandoned. Something to be sought out. The original Hebrew says, People will want to flock there for what's happening there. Where would that be? Jerusalem? Where does Jesus Christ rule from in the second advent? Jerusalem. Sought out, a city not abandoned. Being blessed again. Salvation has finally come there. They've made their turn towards Christ. Something happened, supernatural time. Most of this probably pointing to the second advent. Now, there are some interesting analogies between several chapters in Isaiah and the judgments of the book of Revelation as well. Certainly what we would call the trumpet and bowl judgments, all the different things happening. So, there are some interesting analogies in these chapters. Like I said, 61 into about 66, the end of the book. So there's some interesting analogies between several chapters in Isaiah and the judgments of the book of Revelation, which also all highlight the tribulation into the second advent of Christ. Notice I said tribulation into the second advent of Christ, not the rapture. Remember, the rapture is part of mystery doctrine. It was veiled. Hard to figure out the Old Testament. They didn't know all the mystery doctrines. Within the prophetic teaching, teachings, plural, of Isaiah, most scholars believe chapter 61 into the end of chapter 66. And I would suggest during this time we're studying this this week, take a few minutes. Take 20 minutes, 30 minutes of your time and read chapters Isaiah 61 into 66 and see the end of the chapter and the beginning of the next two. Chapter 61 into the end of chapter 66 points us toward the second advent of Christ into the millennial reign of Christ on earth, thousand years of peace and prosperity of Christ on earth. Isaiah 65, 24 underneath that. Again, I'm just putting a few of these on here. We're going into Isaiah 66 just to show you. I'm giving you some personal homework. Isaiah 65, 24. It will also come to pass that before they call, I will answer. While they are speaking, I will listen. That protocol, again, for the church age believer, we can rely on God doing that all the time giving you an answer before the question. You have to pay attention and be available. Giving you the solution before the problem. You have to pay attention and be available. 
Studying his word is how you get the answer and solution. Isaiah 65, 25. The wolf and the lamb will graze together. When did that happen? In the garden. When would be the next time something like this happens? Thousand year reign of Christ. Verse 25. The wolf and the lamb will graze together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. Perfect world. Jesus Christ. Second advent. And dust will be the serpent's food. Sound familiar? They will do no harm or evil or harm on all my holy mountains, says the Lord. In other words, this is a time of great peace and prosperity, a reflection back to the garden, the time of Christ on earth, second advent. Hard to argue with that. Dust will be the serpent's food and harkens back into the victory proclaimed in the garden, Genesis 3, 14 and 15, when Satan is on his way to defeat, he always tastes the dust of the earth. Isaiah 66, 1. Pick it up there. Isaiah 66, 1. Okay, now you understand where we're going. Now you understand. A lot of these chapters are in relation to what happens at the tribulation. It's like a broad overview. Tribulation into the millennial reign of Christ. Isaiah 66, 1. This is what the Lord said. Heaven is my throne and the earth is the footstool for my feet. Where then is a house you could build for me and where is a place that I may rest? God questions and he knows where he's going to rest. The earth as the footstool speaks to the authority and really the triumph of God. Footstools when you sit back and relax and we know in scripture... Relax until I sit back and sit would be with me, Jesus says, and I will make a footstool out of your enemies. The earth as the footstool speaks to the triumph of God, the authority and power of God. This is believed to be a grand overview of the whole prophetic teaching given to Isaiah in chapter 66, like a wrap-up. This is believed to be a grand overview of the whole prophetic teaching given to Isaiah, like a grand wrap-up, a big overview. Certainly, an accumulation of chapter 61 into chapter 66, meaning the whole end of the times relation to the seven years tribulation, return of Christ, second advent, the thousand years of perfection with Christ, and then a final judgment, great white throne judgment. I can tell you, that's what chapter 66 is believed by many great theologians and pastors and teachers. It reviews a big overview of how God's victory in the end, seven years of tribulation comes to an end, the return of the second, uh, second advent of Christ into the thousand years of perfection with Christ, and then a final judgment, which would be the great white throne judgment. This is how this is viewed. Isaiah 66, 2. For my hand made all these things, so all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But I will look to this one at one who is humble and contrite in spirit and who trembles at my word. What's he saying here? Talking about Israel, those believers that come out of true Israel that have turned to the Lord properly and been born again and saved, they can receive the blessings. One who is humble and contrite. And the Hebrew term is actually Hanachi Nachak. <laughs> Hanachi Nachak. Trying to say it the Hebrew way. Pointing directly to adjusting to the justice of God. That's what it means. What did you do at the beginning of the message? First John 1 John 1.9. You adjusted to the justice of God. That's what it speaks to. It means someone who has turned and accepted that they have failed and they seek truth and reconciliation by God's standard, not mankind's standard. Turning to God's justice system. Saying, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a sinner, I need a savior. You, do, you actually repeat that when you, as a believer, you turn to the cross and say, I realize I sinned, I failed, I can't do this, Lord forgive me. He's already forgiven you on the cross, you just name and cite it. You stepped out of line, you've missed the mark. Same thing. Turning to the justice of God, adjusting to the justice of God. It means someone 
who's turned and accepted they have failed, they seek truth and reconciliation by God's standard, not mankind's standard. True belief upon Christ as the only Lord and Savior. It is a warning for all people, obviously, with a strong emphasis, though, with a strong emphasis upon the nation of Israel. True Israelites need to turn to Christ as Savior to enter into heaven. Just because they can say, well, I've traced my bloodline and I know I'm under the line of Abraham and I can trace myself into the 12 tribes of Israel and all of those wonderful things I've discussed with you about bloodlines means nothing without faith alone in Christ alone. So there's a strong emphasis on the real Israelites to turn. Hanachi Nachach it is the most humble and respectful posture described in this Hebrew term. Putting these two words together, it is the most humble and respectful posture described in this Hebrew term. It means posture of soul and body. You literally turn and realize the Lord and Savior is there. It points to the inner person and how they've turned in humility truthfully toward God. And again, this is an emphasis on the nation of Israel. It also meant to recognize your own weakness or disabilities and lean upon God for help. Another way to look at it. It also meant to recognize, no excuses, your own weakness, your own disabilities, your own failures, and then lean upon God for help. He'll take care of it. That's what it means too. All religious hypocrisy will be rebuked and cleansed off the earth by the end of the seven-year tribulation period. All religious hypocrisy will be rebu rebuked and cleansed off the earth by the end of the seven-year tribulation period. All counterfeits will be revealed as well. Isaiah 66, 3. But the one who slaughters an ox is like one who kills a person. The one who sacrifices a lamb is like one who breaks a dog's neck. Pretty uh, uh, graphic descriptions here. One who offers a grain offering is like one who offers pig's blood. What is he saying? Which one are you? A ritualistic, religious phony or a real believer? One who burns incense is like one who blesses an idol. All the counterfeits are going to be revealed. As they have chosen their own ways. That wraps it up right there. They've chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations. What did I tell you about the nation of Israel and believers in general who keep playing games with God and those who claim to be believers and act religious, but they're part of the tares among the wheat? We've covered all of these things. They've chosen their own ways and their souls delight in their abominations, their religious systems. God will deal with it. God will deal with it, trust me, by the end of the seven year tribulation, there's going to be a lot dealt with. In fact, there's only one rebellion after that. That happens after the thousand year reign of Christ on earth, and it is squashed quickly. So all of this has to do with the end of the tribulation into the millennial reign. This is a warning of the highest order concerning false religion. Some things we've covered. False religion, man-made systems and rituals that many agents and seeds of Satan hide behind. All their rituals will be exposed. All their lies will be exposed. Religion and rituals they hide behind. Religion and rituals they hide behind while they are involved in all sorts of evil in those dark hidden chambers we looked at recently in Mystery Babylon study. Religion and rituals they hide behind while they're involved in all sorts of evil in those dark and hidden chambers we studied. What we just learned about from our recent study of Mystery Babylon. Listen, if you haven't been with me, I would go back and study that. It's very pertinent. It opens up a lot of things going on today. And we're going to have to touch back into some of these things that I recently showed you in the near future. Isaiah 66, 4. So will I, I will choose their punishments and bring on them what they dread. Because I called, but no one answered. I spoke, but they did not listen. Instead, they did evil in my sight and chose that in which I did not delight. Even believers have done these things. 
But he's really clarifying here in Isaiah, I believe a lot of this has to do, and, and many, many good scholars believe a lot of this has to do with the counterfeit, the tares among the wheat. God knows the true heart of humanity. God knows the true heart of humanity and all the agents and seeds of Satan who fooled others will not fool God in the end. That's what this speaks to. All the ones that got away, that you think got away with something, all the counterfeits and lies, agents and seeds of Satan over the years, in the end, they don't fool God. They never do. His timing and your timing, two different things. Isaiah 66, 5. Isaiah 66, 5. So this all has to do with a big overview, closing this out with, with Isaiah, a big overview of God's discipline coming down and his final discipline, which happens between the period of the baptism of fire and happens again at the great white throne judgment. He cleans everything up, amen? All the lies and counterfeits are exposed. Isaiah 66, 5, hear the word of the Lord. You who tremble at his word have utmost respect. Your brothers who hate you, who exclude you on account of my name, most of them are phonies and counterfeits anyway, have said, let the Lord be glorified so that we may see your joy, but they will be put to shame. Again, the word counterfeit should come to mind of what I've been teaching you certainly into the last couple of years, but opening up this year with the false brethren, the false teachers, the counterfeits are exposed by God in the end. All of it will be exposed. Between the baptism of fire when Christ returns, battle of Armageddon, the beginning of the thousand year reign of Christ, and then what he wipes clean, and then the final judgment of the great white throne judgment, God will deal with it all. All the phonies and liars, agents and seeds of Satan, the tares among the wheat will not stand in the white hot light of truth. They may seem like they stand now, but believe me, God is saying here in Isaiah 66, I'll deal with this once and for all time. There's a time coming when everything is going to change. Isaiah 66, 6, a sound of an uproar from the city. A voice from the temple, the voice of the Lord who is dealing retribution, kamal, kamal, to his enemies. When did this ever happen before? Never. This is going to happen. Future tense. The voice of the Lord who is dealing retribution, kamal, to his enemies. This speaks to God's wrath, folks. God's judgment or tribulation. Retribution, payback, or recompense. That's what it means. Judgment, retribution, payback, or recompense. Kamal means to come to fruition, to receive the reward. You can use it either way, or the punishment. You can use it in the positive that somebody just won the contest. They get the trophy. Now they get their fruits of their labor. Gamal means to come to fruition to receive the reward or, in this case, the punishment that is legally called for. Punishment that is legally called for. It comes to fruition. God will weed and tear it, take the weeds and the tares among the wheat. He'll expose all of the lies and counterfeits in his timing. Much of this final chapter is a larger overview of God dealing with the events of the end times. That's how you have to understand this chapter. So much of this final chapter is a larger overview of God dealing with the events of the end times. Now, now, <laughs> take a breath. Here's where some Christians get a little touchy. And I'm going to explain it to the best of my ability today into Thursday's message. Isaiah 66, 7. So, we already know, and I've already given you homework, the last couple of chapters leading into 66 all point to the judgment of God, the wrath of God, the tribulation, the millennial reign of Christ, final judgment. Isaiah 66, 7, before she was in labor, she delivered. Before her pain came, 
she gave birth to a boy. Obviously, in the ancient world, don't get insulted, ladies. The boy was a little bit held a little higher because they would take over the throne, take over the business. It, it was a blessing to have a boy, certainly first. This reference, without any warning or pain, a new birth occurs. This references, without any warning or any pain, nothing. Just like, oh, I'm pregnant, there's the baby. And it's a perfect boy, the one we wanted. This references, without any warning or pain, a new birth occurs. The focus is upon the nation of Israel, and you can see it simply by getting into these two scriptures, verse 7 and verse 8. The focus is upon the nation of Israel, and by all accounts, it is pointing toward the end times, possibly the end of the seven years tribulation. I know people don't want to hear this. All these last few chapters of Isaiah are strongly suggesting the second advent and the millennial reign of Christ. All these chapters leading into 66 as an overview of final judgment, all pointing to the tribulation, the end of the tribulation, the millennial reign of Christ, second advent, and even, as you're going to see at the end, the great white throne judgment. Isaiah 66, 8, here it is. Big debates. People lose their mind over this. Isaiah 66, 8, listen. I've gone back and forth over the last 10 years, but I know... What I've studied and I know what to be accurate. Isaiah 66, 8. Who has heard of such a thing? Who has seen such a thing? Can a land be born in one day? Can a nation be given birth all at once? As soon as Zion was in labor, no way to look around it, nation of Israel, she also delivered her sons. Plural. When the nation has reached its turning point, and the final judgment of God on the discipline of Israel has come to an end, tribulation, it will be reborn for the thousand years of Christ on earth. Now, <laughs> take a step, take a, de a deep breath and take a step back, because sometimes there's layers to things. We'll take a look at that, possibly next lesson. But when the nation has reached its turning point and the final judgment of God on the discipline of Israel has come to an end, it will be reborn for the thousand years of Christ on earth. It will happen immediately at the beginning of the thousand years of peace on earth. And again, I would challenge you to even go back on many of the theologians and teachers, whether my lineage or anywhere else that you consider really good and strong, and see if they do not teach this as a thousand year reign, rebirth of Israel. Isaiah 66, 9, shall I bring to the point of birth, but do not give delivery, says the Lord? Or shall I, who gives delivery, shut that womb up, says the Lord? The delivery of true Israel happens at the second advent of Christ. The delivery by God, the delivery by God of the true Israel happens at the second advent of Christ. Now, again... Take a step back, take a breath, relax. There may be more to this than meets the eye. I know many believe this is a prophecy for the birth of Israel almost overnight, which did happen in 1948. We're actually going to take a look at some history next lesson. I'm going to try to wrap this up in two lessons. It may take three. But I know many believe this is a singular prophecy about 1948. But that means you take this whole section, these three or four scriptures, out of the context of Isaiah chapter 63, 64, 65, into 66. You can't do that. There may be more to meet the eye than this, is what I'm telling you. So relax. I know many believe this is a prophecy for the birth of Israel, possibly almost overnight, which happened in 1948. Yet we cannot neglect what Isaiah's chapter 61 into chapter 66 has shown us. You cannot. And I would challenge you to find some good teachers and good theologians that you trust to see what they say. You cannot cherry pick one scripture or two scriptures and make it something that you want to hear. You have to look at the whole picture. Now there's many layers to scripture we can look at. But next lesson, we will peel this back a little further with more prophetic words that sometimes confuse people. 
And I just want to be clear with everything. Too many people are putting dates and numbers. And I'm telling you right now, this is the year of a lot of false teaching coming forward. The next set of scriptures instructs us to what? Rejoice and have joy in Jerusalem's future. We have to go into the next set of scriptures telling us to what? Rejoice, have joy in Jerusalem's future. Really, Israel's future, Isaiah 66.10. Be joyful with Jerusalem and rejoice for her. For all you who love her, be exceedingly glad with her. All you who mourn over her, rejoice. Isaiah 66, 11, so that you may nurse and be satisfied. That means come to comfort there with her comforting breasts, so that you may drink fully and be delighted with her bountiful breasts. Nursing and breast and motherly, all of these things mean you come forward and you find comfort and strength there. The call is for all believers to find peace and refuge with the reborn Israel all promises and covenants are fulfilled where? In the second advent. Not now. I would tell you most of the people in Israel don't believe. Now, there may be some Messianic Jews that believe in Christ, but most don't. This is talking about believers in the future. This is pointing to an abundance of peace and prosperity. That only happens when King Jesus rules from Jerusalem. So we can't ignore that. Isaiah 66, 12. For this is what the Lord says, Behold, I extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the nations, plural, around the world, like an overflowing stream, and you will be nursed, you will be carried on the hip and rocked back and forth on the knees. This is all description of, of really of phenomenal blessings. Protection, blessing, growth, all of these wonderful things. Isaiah 66, 13. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you will be comforted in Jerusalem. Kind of hard to be comforted there today, right? Even in the past. Jerusalem has had times of peace and prosperity, absolutely. But it's also been riddled with attacks and pressures all around its border. There's probably no other nation surrounded by more enemies. But here it's saying it's a place of comfort. Jerusalem has had times of peace and prosperity, absolutely. But it also has been riddled with attacks and pressure all around it. Listen, even after 1948, you got many of you know about the 1960s when there was the Six-Day War there. God's hand was on that. We'll take a look at some of these things. I just want you to step back and think about these things because there's a lot of people putting dates and times and bringing forth a lot of questions about dispensations, the rapture, the tribulation. Take a breath and take a step back. We have to study it as God lays it out for us. The next few verses do give interesting analogies and prophecies that we can look at next message, and we will. We're actually going to pick it up in Isaiah, probably 66, 10, or 11 in there. Maybe even go back a little further and then cover it more. But I wanted to get into this portion today because I know it's a sticking point for many people. And there's a lot there. I'll cover it. I'll look at it from every angle I can look at it. And you're going to come to your own decision. But I'm going to show you the truth of the scripture. I don't hide from it. I don't run from these things. I try to open them up to the best of my ability. And even if I think from 10 years ago that this meant that. And God is showing me, no, this means this. Or this might be part of that. I have to teach that. I have to be academically honest. That's the call of a pastor teacher. It's not about emotions. It's about being academically honest and following the spirit and the word. I thank you for your time. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Father, bless this message. Take it out to a lost and dying world through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.